be good to have uh, 2 Samuel 23 open as we look at uh, this passage together this evening. Uh, You'll understand why I might skip trying to pronounce too many more of their names uh, through this this, this evening, but uh, it's maybe a bit of an odd thing to do in some ways to just read through a long list of people. It's a bit like you get to certain lists of genealogies in the Bible and you, you look at the names and you go, maybe in your daily Bible reading, you get to it and you go, do I need to read all of these? Actually, yes. They're in there for a reason. We're going to think about that together this evening. But it is perhaps in some ways a bit of a surprising passage, isn't it? Uh, you read it and there's just this list of little battles, Victories, not small victories either. There's some huge victories that took place here. And you go, well, how do we understand or even begin to think of a passage like this? What do you think? What is the underpinning tone of this passage? Actually, it's one of joy and thankfulness. Here is a list of a whole load of people who were, as we're told there in verse 8, described as David's mighty warriors. This is a passage that speaks with joy about the wonderful things that different people have done at different points in the life of the kingdom. It's not just simply David giving a list of all his buddies. These are people that he's lifting up and wanting to remind the people, the writer certainly is, we don't even we don't know if it was David who wrote uh, to Samuel, uh, but the writer is lifting these people up and saying, here are some significant people and wonderful actions, and there is a joy to be found in seeing all that's taken place here, because they're described as being David's mighty warriors. These are people who, under David, under his reign, as part of his kingdom, worked for David, served the purposes of God's kingdom, protected his people, and demonstrated what it meant to be faithful to their king. That's why the passage is here. It's to show us the joy that David, as king, had over seeing his people serving and engaging and getting on with the business of the kingdom. It is, in some ways, a picture of the glory of God seen in the actions of his people. David is delighting in what his people did because they were his. And the Lord also delights in his people because they do things for him. So we're going to think about it just with... Uh, briefly with three headings this evening the first is uh, triumph triumph um, as you know we home educate uh, phoebe uh, and we're on various sort of networks and things and on facebook there's uh, one home ed group and, and every single week uh, it tends to be uh, that one of the admins post puts a post on facebook and they say right time for your weekly wins what are they and um, i don't know whether anybody ever pays any attention to it because it's almost nearly empty um, and occasionally there are people who say, oh yeah, we, th- this went well this week. Um, but it's, it's not often that you look on, that you ever go and look at it. Uh, not that I do, but every time, it, whenever, whenever it does pop up, you just look how many comments are there and it's usually zero. You go, oh dear, it's just nobody had a good week. Um, and there are moments, aren't there, where we, we get that. Moments where it doesn't look like anything has gone particularly well at all. The, every, uh, any benefits don't either haven't materialized or they seem to be entirely absent uh, from our lives David's life and the life of Israel under David when he was king it was full of ups and downs wasn't it no many many ups but as we thought about it over the last few months, to, you know, towards the end of David's life, it just seems to be this catalogue of problems one after the other. And yet you get a passage like this that just points out how many, you know, if we want to call it this, you know, wins there were among the people of Israel. For all the misery that there would have been enjoyed. In fact, the fact that we're talking here about a passage that has a whole load of battles and there would have been an immense amount of grief caused by each one of these instances. There's a whole load of things that have gone right and demonstrate a victory that is pleasing and honouring 
and there is a glory to be found in it. We're told initially in verses uh, 8 to 12 of these uh, three men, uh, three of the, the, the chief men, it would appear. Uh, we're told of some of their battles that they were involved in. Uh, we're told of Je- um, Jeshep, uh, the first man there in verse 8 and 9, uh, who uh, raises his spear and kills 800 men in one encounter. And there's Eliezer, uh, who stood his ground and struck down the Philistines until he his hand is frozen to his sword. You know, he's, his, his hand is locked in place. It's been so used to gripping it for the length and entirety of the battle with such ferocity that, that he can't undo it. And then we have Sharma, who again stands in a field full of lentils to defend a field of lentils. It's, it's not the lentils he's defending, is it? But he's defending Israel. It's just that that was the place where he took his stand. And we're told something about these men. Not a single one of these three, interestingly, are actually natural-born Israelites. They are all men who have come to be counted among God's people because they've come to, obviously, know, know the God of the people. There's an encouragement, I think, in that straight away. Reminding us that the the power of the gospel to change hearts is such, uh, such, it works to such a great extent that there is a love that is prepared, that means that they are prepared to stand up, to defend and to work for the sake of those among whom they now count themselves. They, they, they don't count themselves as outsiders of God's people. They very much belong with God's people. And God uses them in service and ministry. It's a lovely picture, isn't it, for all of us here, unless we're from certainly of Israel descent, we're part of those Gentile people, those who were on the outside. And it's even even greater when it's been considered as being a spiritual picture. Those who were once far away from God, brought in and used and strengthened by God to be able to stand. And that is the point in these first few verses. We're told both there in verse 10 and verse 12, Eliezer stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. And verse 12, we're told about Sharma, that he took his stand in the middle of the field, he defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. It wasn't these men. David says... The writer says it was the Lord. They were the means, the tool, the instrument, but it was God. How many times do we find in scripture that it is the Lord? How many things wouldn't have happened in scripture if the Lord hadn't been there? If the Lord hadn't worked? Now, if we think about things in our own lives, how often would would our plans have failed? How often would our wisdom and our words fallen short? How often would our evangelism be ineffective? How often would our faith have faltered if it wasn't for the Lord? It wasn't these men. It was the Lord. When we think about our own lives as Christians. And it seems that there is something maybe overwhelming to do. It feels that there we're, we're really up against it. Actually, we know that there's no hope if it wasn't for the Lord. If it wasn't for God, no, we know, and the fact that we know that he is able to strengthen and provide and supply and meet every need. These men are supernaturally empowered by God to serve him and the people. I don't know when the last time was you picked up a spear um, and, we, and, and, and even did you know, some spear fighting drills 800 times. Now, the physical exhaustion that that alone would, in, would, would incur is incredible. And they're not light easy things. If you try and do anything in with a repetit- repetitively, it is going to be hard physically. When was the last time you 
stood and defended a field, probably never, uh, from all the foes that came along. These men were supernaturally enabled by God. See, the point here is that the praise and the defence of God's people is always to go to the Lord. The victories that God's people have are not our own victories if we are able to overcome temptation. It's not because you've been wonderful, it's because of the Lord. If you've had no struggles with relationships, you've come through with that not because you've worked hard or because other people have invested in you it is because of the Lord if you've gone through different challenges and and and, and burdens and concerns yeah you might have come through and you might be very conscious of all the things that you did in order to help you get through that point you might have gone and sought help from other people but it wasn't you it was the Lord And as the people of Israel look at these men as they come away from battle, do we think that they're full of energy and bounding off for the next thing? They're going to be physically exhausted. That's the point often, isn't it? These men didn't have the resources or strength in and of themselves to achieve these incredible feats. But God did. That's why... In some ways, I think Paul often mentions, doesn't he, about us being as like jars of clay or being weak. Why? Because he says when we are weak, then we are strong because we're we're filled and empowered and we know that the strength and the help of God. That's why Jesus says in John chapter 15, verse 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. We might be tempted to think at different points and problems when we look at everything going on around about us. Oh, if only we had this. If only we had that. If only that could work out. And if only this could happen. Well, they might not be wrong things to think. But what does this passage tell us we need more than anything else or anyone else? It's the Lord. When problems seem unachievable, insurmountable, what do we do? We remember uh, the Lord and who he is (coughs) and the power that he works in his people and the sustaining and strength that he provides. That's why any one of us carries on as a believer. Our lives, and as we demonstrate that uh, in an ongoing sense, our lives are to be this continual testimony to the power of God at work in us. As, these, as the people of Israel saw these men achieving these great feats, they were supposed to be encouraged at seeing what God can do. When you look and see the ways in which God solves and strengthens and enables and protects and equips his people here and in other places that we know of, does it encourage you that your confidence in the Lord is right? Does it encourage you that the Lord will be able to strengthen you to be able to stand? It will give you the ability and the help beyond the ordinary means so that you might be able to persevere and see the Lord's triumph in and through you as well. And secondly, uh, we need to we see that there should be some thankfulness. Um, we know that you can survive up to uh, about three days uh, without water, uh, but long before you get to the end of those three days, you're going to be physically really struggling. There have been some rare cases in there where people managed to survive a little bit longer than that. I think I saw on the news was it just today or yesterday uh, there was someone who'd been lost in some mountains and they found them after three days. You know, I don't know how much water she had with her uh, but she was certainly going to be running out of time. Uh, but there is a limit perhaps as to what we might look to do to get some water even though the need becomes desperate. We're told this uh, little account of David. It took place during harvest time. We're told in verse 13 Uh, when uh, David 
uh, is at the cave of Adullam. Uh, it's quite possibly uh, whilst David was running away from Saul. Uh, the Philistines have encamped uh, around him and uh, David's hiding in the stronghold uh, and he gets thirsty. Uh, he's cut off. There's no obvious place for, for drink uh, in any sense. They've obviously started to run out of the resources that they possessed. And David says there in verse 15, Oh, that someone would go and get a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. There's a problem, though. Uh, the Philistine army are, are camped around there. And these three men, uh, three, we're told these three, the three mighty warriors, uh, broke through the Philistine lines, drew water uh, from the well, and went back to Beth, uh, uh, and went back to David with it. I mean, it's a pretty ex pretty extreme sort of trip to go and get some food. It's, it's, it's far worse than trying to fight anybody off at Tesco's uh, for buying a bottle of water or something. And they didn't go and deal with angry handbags. They were dealing with proper swords and spears through an enemy army who are determined to wipe them out just as much as they are determined to protect their land because they were an invading force. And they bring it to David after all their labours and David says, thank you very much, I can't drink it, pours it out on the, on the ground as an offering to the Lord. And, you know, and the remarkable thing in this passage is these guys don't seem to be hopping mad. Now you can imagine it, can you? David, look at what we just did for you, and you go and do that? They're not offended. Why? Because this is a passage that talks about the love that they have for David. And they see that David recognises the love that they have for him. It's an extraordinary friendship, isn't it? I don't know if someone said to you, uh, I'm feeling thirsty, can I, have a, get, can I have a drink? What extent would you be prepared to go to to get them uh, uh, water? Uh, probably charging through an enemy line, if that is something nearby to you, is not really going to sort of feature highly on our list of desirable things to achieve. So as I recognise that this is, a, this is a gift of love that you've brought to me, and he pours it out before the Lord, saying, I, I can't drink this, for I, for I see what gift this is. It's something that is pleasing to him. It speaks a lot, doesn't it, of their friendship for David. The extent that they were prepared to go to, to care for someone whom they loved. It's an extraordinary length. It's worth just simply, at some point, contemplating what kind of a friend are you to, to those around about you? Are there limits on the friendship that you have? You know, inevitably there are going to be some limits. There are physical limitations or time limitations and some of the things we may do to care for and to support one another. But do we demonstrate a friendship that is meaningful? A friendship that has purpose? A friendship that is willing to give of self for someone we love? And maybe there are moments where you can look at uh, your experience uh, and you can see times when friends have done things extraordinarily for you. Caught you by surprise by their display of love or by the depth of the things that they've done and they've been prepared to do for you. And we could flip it on the other way. Are you also the kind of friend that is willing to receive help? David asks the question, and it almost seems hypothetical there in verse 15. And you now David, we know he doesn't actually drink it. But he doesn't say to the guys, whoa, you shouldn't have done that, take it back. You know, go back, fight through the army ranks, go and, re go and return it to the well. You, you, that was a really silly thing to do, guys. There's a thankfulness of David. When someone is, makes the effort to help you, help you, it might not be that you expected them to do it, but are you at least thankful for the effort that they went to? But really, this picture is stronger, isn't it? Because re what really what they're demonstrating is the kind of devotion to David that you and I are supposed to have to the Lord Jesus. Now, these are men who, who demonstrate that there was nothing that they wouldn't do for their king. 
They were prepared to walk through uh, an incredibly intense experience at the risk of their own lives, of their own stake, so that they might demonstrate to their king their absolute love and obedience and enjoyment and thankfulness for him. Are you thankful for those moments when you had those glimpses and you realised just how much you love the Lord Jesus? Now, the one thing that comes out of this is that these men, they, they, their, their love for, for David is exposed. And isn't it true that when we have those experiences of realising just how much we love the Lord Jesus, actually, isn't that an exhilarating moment? Realising that we, we do love him. Realising that there is something that we we're not prepared to withhold from doing for him. Prepared to go to such to a great extent. Uh, there's a Christian I was talking with a while back. And they were saying that their, they thought their faith was fake. Uh, that they weren't really a Christian at all. And so I asked them, well, what stops you from walking away right now? And immediately they came out with the answer, but I love Jesus. But they, they, they knew that they couldn't deny their Lord because they, they loved him. And they were able to say, well, actually, I'm thankful that I can see that and realise that. Now, to what extent am I, is that going to then mean that I'm going to go and follow him? Well, maybe there are times when you know, we become you know, tired and weary. You've, you know, the last time you ran one of the ministry groups here at the church, it didn't go particularly well. Maybe the, the previous week's experience is rough. The kids, for whatever reason, might have been rowdy. You go, I don't really feel like going to do that. You go, well, no, I'm, I love Jesus. I'm not doing this for my own benefit. I'm doing this to serve Jesus. Or maybe there's an opportunity for us to sin. The temptation rears. You remember... I love Jesus. I'm going to deny myself, my own passions, my own lusts. I'm going to put him first. Maybe there's more, more, more joyful times when we, when we see how uh, you know, the love of Jesus actually inspired us and encouraged us to do things maybe beyond our own comfort level for him. Because ultimately, you know, why do we do anything for God? Why do these men do anything for David? It's because they loved him. No, their love for David was, ref was only reflective of the love that he had for them. And when we remember just how much we are loved by the Lord Jesus, what does that spur us to do? What is there that we would withhold from doing for him? And sometimes, as we see here, that calls us to, to walk difficult paths. It presents us with a dilemma. It might even put us in challenging or dangerous positions in our workplaces, in our culture. It might even put us in challenging and comp or, or what might appear to be compromising positions, it, it, even at times within our own households, especially if they're not Christians. But are we prepared to risk all for Jesus because we love him? Because he loves us, we love him. And when we see those signs, that evidence, those reminders that we do really love him, that we are prepared to serve him, are we thankful? Are we thankful for every reminder of just how much the Lord Jesus means to us? Are we thankful for every display that we see among the Lord's people, that where they show that they truly love him? And find it, and do we find that an encouragement in our own lives? And then, thirdly, uh, we have treasured. treasured. Um, Ellie's grandmother. Uh, she had a, a wall in her kitchen uh, that was used to be absolutely covered in photo frames, uh, and there, some of them were, were photo frames with multiple photos in, in each frame. 
and uh, you could stand in the kitchen there with her and you could ask her who these people were and she could tell you not only she knew not, not only who everyone was but she could tell you a lot about each of those people and the memories that she had and the, it really what it was it was a wall of the people that she loved deeply she knew every single one of them and where they were and what they'd been up to and she, she, she treasured their memories and every single thought of them was, was something of a joy for her to consider. Well, from verse 24 onwards, we do just have this long list of men who did what we're not exactly told. Some of them we're told that they were armour bearers, others... Uh, we're just, we seem to be just uh, listed there. And, and we go, well, okay, <laughs> what, what's a list of people like this just doing it? You know, what, why list these people? Why call them, you know, mighty men, wonderful servants, you know, powerful figures, and not tell us what they did, all of them? And the point is, we don't need to know everything that they did. But everything they did was known not only by David but more importantly, by the Lord. These were men who, for whatever it might be, I mean, it might even be that they, you know, if, if they wrote them down uh, for us to be able to understand, maybe we'd look at the list and go, of course, is that all they did? Now, so-and-so at the beginning of there killed 800 people to defend Israel. He did what? Oh, he had a conversation with someone. Oh, he was David's counsellor. Oh, you know, he, he stood up for David and supported uh, part of David's, one of David's policies. Oh, he was just a faithful husband. We don't know. The point is, David says, these are, these are the men who did wonderful things. These are the men who supported the kingdom. These are the men who demonstrated in their own life, in their own way, in, in different circumstances and settings, among, among the ability, the opportunity, and the time given to them, they demonstrated them and uh, themselves faithful to the king. The point is this. <clears throat> it doesn't matter what they did. But it's the fact that they were known to be those who were faithful. Those who were known to be involved in service. Those who demonstrated clearly, publicly, privately their love of God's king. We're told, aren't we, in Psalm 139, verse 3, that the Lord knows our going out and our coming in. He's familiar with all of our ways. Now, just as David was familiar with the actions of his people, our God is familiar with all the things that you and I are doing for him, that demonstrate our faithfulness, that demonstrate our love and our obedience and our delight and our enjoyment. It's not necessarily everything is known. There are many things that take place in the church here that are just not known about by everyone. There are some of you who, if we mentioned it, mentioned it, you'd be highly embarrassed because you like to be able to do things quietly. That's okay. These men, I'm sure that they, you know, they, they, they didn't necessarily know that their names are going to be written down in God's word for all generations, for all time to be able to read. But maybe if they knew that, maybe they would have ended up doing things that they would have, admit, would have meant that they weren't put in here. There's a humility in the fact that they, we don't know what they did, but just that they were, they were David's mighty men. Are we content for our actions, for our God, to be known only by him? You know, when you do something for the Lord or you serve in some way, do we want no need everyone else to know about it? Everyone else to come and say, well, you've done a wonderful job, pat on the back, good for you. Or is it enough for us to know that our God knows? no matter how big or how small it might be, how private or how public it is. These people did things that would have taken courage and conviction. There's going to have to be dedication and effort. 
might not have been, as I said, might not have been massive things. It's a bit like a, you know, when a child brings a really soggy, gluey piece of paper home to mum and dad and says, look, I've done this for you. Well, you look at the scrawl on the paper and go, I don't really understand what it is, but it's precious. The things that we do for God, just as, what, as the things that were done here by David's men for David were precious to him, the things we do for God are precious. They are treasured in God's sight. Isaiah chapter 66 verse 2. Isaiah 66 verse 2, the Lord says this, These are the ones I look on with favour, those who are humble and contrite in spirit, and who tremble at my word. God is pleased when he sees his people walking before him in faithfulness. So, um, Proverbs uh, chapter 2 verses 15 and 16 is described there saying that then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And there were going to be other people in the kingdom that served, that were, that were faithful citizens under David. But these ones really stood out. Well, similarly for us as believers, we are to, in a dark world, we are to stand out as like stars in the sky, demonstrating our faithfulness and obedience to God so that when the Lord looks at a dark world, just as when we look at a dark sky, we enjoy seeing the stars. When the Lord looks at a dark world, he sees you and I. And it is a sight pleasing to him as we, uh, and precious as we work for him and bring a delight to him. That's why Jesus says in John 15 verse 8, preaching John this evening without even being there but John 15 verse 8 this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit and they might not be written in lights it's not going to be added into scripture but are you pleased to be able to do things for the Lord know that they are treasured by him and please him Actually, that should encourage us, shouldn't it, to look to be faithful this week, this evening after the service, tomorrow morning when we wake up. And to remember the Lord's gaze is on us and we, by the help of his spirit, the changing grace of the Lord Jesus in our hearts, can live lives that are pleasing to him, faithful and honouring. So this passage is a theme, it has a theme of joy, and it does, doesn't it? You know, the, the delight of seeing the work of God in his people, using them in his service, encouraging the saints, being, a, being valued by our heavenly king. Well, may the Lord help us to know those things in our own lives too.